And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. And Abraham called the name of his son Isaac. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. The thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The seed of Ishmael today are just as was prophesied from an earlier passage. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. This from Muhammad's Allah. Fight those who believe not in Allah, even if they are the people of the book. Fight in the cause of Allah. Whether he is slain or gets victory, soon we shall give him a reward of great value. I have been ordered by Allah to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and the Muhammad is Allah's apostle. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers, smite ye above their necks, and smite all their fingertips off them. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Here we see Jerusalem. Here's a traditional location of Mount Sinai, a new presumed location at Jabal el Awaz, northwestern Arabia, thousand kilometers from Mecca. And Abraham lived 900 years before the first caravan route was ever established along the Red Sea here. While most Middle East Muslims today may well be of the seed of Ishmael, Muhammad himself was more likely a Hamite, whose ancestors migrated across the strait from Ethiopia to Yemen, which is where Muhammad's tribe was from. Yet even as scripture explains that Yahweh's covenants are with the seed of Isaac, that the seed of Hagar are in the bondage of the flesh, Muslims proudly proclaim to be of the seed of Hagar's son Ishmael. What could make their bondage to the flesh more apparent than their daily prostration toward the Quraysh pagan's black stone idol in Mecca and their adopted and adapted Quraysh moon, sun, star, and jinn devil worship rituals of the Hajj and Umrah? Indeed, the pagans and Muslims perform these rituals side by side until a year before Muhammad's last Hajj when the pagans were kicked out of their own rituals. In the year prior to the last Hajj of the Prophet, Abu Bakr sent me in the company of a group of people to make a public announcement. No pagan is allowed to perform Hajj after this year, and no naked person is allowed to perform Twaf of the Kaaba. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as a heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They pray ritualistically five times a day, practice ablution, wear long white robes, and fast during the month of Ramadan just as the Sabians did. Amazingly, Muslims believe they pray five times a day because Muhammad claimed he learned the ordinance on a trip up to paradise one night when he was riding around on a flying donkey mule. 
perhaps not coincidentally, the Zoroastrians believe their fabled prophet rode on a mythical flying steed, or Barak, to the dwelling place of his immortal ancestors as well. Since Zoroastrianism was spread widely by the 7th century, was it really a great leap for an illiterate southwest Arabian desert dweller to make the claim that he himself did the same? Indeed, it didn't even require imagination. Yet Muslims believe Muhammad's tall tale purely because Muhammad claimed it, without a single witness to his flying steed, let alone its journey. This while history tells us that the mosque that he claimed he prayed in in Jerusalem had been torn down almost 500 years before his claim of having prayed in it. Even most of the few illiterate Southwest Arabian desert dwellers Muhammad was able to glean in the first 13 years of Islam left his religion after he told his tall tale. So what's with his followers in this 21st century information age? Muhammad's night journey can't be passed off as metaphorical without labeling the most authoritative reporter of Muhammad's life a liar. The sites which Allah's apostle was shown were actual sites, not dreams. Muslims following a self-proclaimed prophet in his tall tales, even as they pay lip service that they believe in Jesus and believe he was a great prophet, while believing Jesus' own prophecy and the whole subject of the gospel to be false. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And he shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day... He shall rise again. Please see the crucifixion of the Messiah in prophecy video for more. While desperately seeking salvation through inheritance, that is, through the flesh, rather than through the Spirit by being born again and enjoying a life in Christ Jesus, an Islamic Mufti YouTuber wrote the following to me. Wasn't Esau, Edom, the firstborn son of Isaac? Allah said to Abraham, I will make my covenant with Isaac and his children. Well, I think Esau, Edom, was child of Isaac. But I show you facts that 95% of Edom's children are Sunni Muslims, now mixed with their Arab cousins, the descendants of the other son of Abraham, Ishmael. While he admitted the scriptural reality that Yahweh made his covenant with the seed of Isaac, and specifically not with Ishmael, except by way of Isaac's seed, Esau, what did Esau do with his birthright that this Mufti lays claim to for 95% of Edom's children are Sunni Muslims now mixed with their Arab cousins? And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint, therefore was his name called Edom, after red pottage. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau traded the inheritance of those Sunni Muslims for little bread and pottage of lentils. In the Simon Magnus Gnosticism Ebionites in Islam video, we explored the likely source of Muhammad's denial of the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of the Messiah that he received by way of his wife Khadijah's cousin, Waraka bin Nufal, who was an Ebionite occult priest. It is the spirit of the prince of the power of the air that guides magicians, sorcerers, and Gnostics like facilities and other blasphemers that contend against the apostles as Simon Magnus did. 
Muhammad's followers must not only deny the whole subject of the gospel, but are even compelled to believe that when Jesus returns, he will break the cross. Allah's apostle said, The hour will not be established until the Son of Mary descends amongst you as a just ruler. He will break the cross, kill the pigs, and abolish the jizya tax. Money will be in abundance. Jesus apparently to return and reverse the testimonies of all of his prophets, disciples, apostles, and witnesses bequeathed to us as the whole subject of the gospel as well as the historical record. And wouldn't you know it, money in abundance, Muhammad again revealing his focus on the things of the flesh. Whether through his extra-large bevy of wives, concubines, and slaves that his Allah allotted only to him, or the chicken and wine-serving bordello of his imagination that he called paradise. The prophet used to visit all his wives in a round, during the day and night. They were eleven in number. Ayas and us had the prophet the strength for it, and us replied, we used to say that the prophet was given the strength of thirty men neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children but in Isaac shall thy seed be called that is they which are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but the children of promise are counted for the seed of the carnal paradise of Muhammad's imagination for example they will be on thrones encrusted with gold and precious stones Gold and precious stones are the kind of things that ensnare folks of this world into the things of the flesh and away from the things of the Spirit of God. And with fruits, any they may select, will we be required to eat in the hereafter? Round about them will serve use of perpetual freshness. Will there be servants or slaves in the hereafter? as Muhammad and his followers press into service in this world, even today? With goblets, shining beakers, and cups filled out of clear flowing fountains, is it a mere coincidence that fresh running water is perhaps the most frequently mentioned element in this desert dweller's paradise? And the flesh of fowls, any that they may desire, do our Muslim friends really believe that heaven includes a chicken in every pot? And there will be companions with beautiful, big, lustrous eyes. Is this what the women are looking forward to in Muhammad's paradise? Does this sound more like something that might be promised to men to encourage suicidal loyalty during imperialistic conquest? In long shade, extended not a lot of shade in the southwest Arabian desert either. Particularly in the barren area of Mecca that only gets about one-tenth the rainfall that even Yemen does. By water flowing constantly and fruit in abundance and on thrones of dignity raised high. Feeding a false sense of self-righteousness raised high above who or what? We have created their companions of special creation and made them virgin, pure, and undefiled, beloved by nature, equal in age. Is this really what women want, or are they the ones that wind up cooking the chicken in Muhammad's paradise? And to go along with those multiple virgins, their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. The following verse should be a relief for those that prefer natural fibers. And because they were patient and constant, he will reward them with a garden and garments of silk. To the seed of Hagar, you can break that bondage of the flesh through a relationship with the Messiah, Yeshua, the Son of the living God. The Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You don't need to prostrate yourself to the Quraysh pagans Kaaba in Mecca five times a day for your prayers to be heard by the one true 
omnipresent God of the scriptures, particularly since there is not a shred of historical or archaeological record that suggests that Mecca ever even existed before about the 4th century A.D. when immigrants from Yemen settled the area and built their Kaaba in the early 5th century A.D. for Arabian star family and jinn devil worship. You can repent of the things of the flesh and be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You don't have to be burdened with the blasphemy of believing that our immortal, sinless Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who took on his glorified body, will return again only to die a mortal fleshly death. This while being compelled to deny the blood that would save you because of your faith in the Gnostic doctrine of Simonianism that you received by way of the self-proclaimed Prophet Muhammad's first wife Khadijah's cousin, Waraka. While Muhammad was only able to gain about a hundred followers in the first thirteen years of his new religion, after his fantastic tale of riding on a flying donkey mule one night, he lost most of the few he had gained. Indeed, his religious invention would have likely died right then and there if he hadn't moved to Medina and enlisted the aid of the two caravan-plundering bandit tribes of Awas and Khazraj to attack, slaughter, sexually abuse, and plunder the Jewish farming communities of Medina. Muhammad stole swords and armor from them and began the transformation of his religion into an imperialistic political system, eventually exacting his revenge on and subjugating his own tribe, the Quraysh in Mecca. Certainly one reason for Muhammad's need to silence them was that they were too well familiar with the sources of much of his inspiration. Muhammad even having been compelled to receive a special revelation in a transparent attempt at damage control. We know indeed, they say, it is a man that teaches him. The tongue of him they wickedly point to is notably foreign, while this is Arabic pure and clear. So many locals recognize Muhammad's ex-Christian friend Jabber as being one of the primary sources of his revelations that the local nickname for Jabber became Holy Spirit. So what kind of behavior might the prince of the power of the air that inspires his people to disbelieve the whole subject of the gospel call his people to do through his spirit? I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. They fight in his cause, slay and are slain, a promise binding on him in the Koran. While fighting is obligatory for Muhammad's true followers, the gospel binds no such thing as was falsely attributed to it in that surah, but instead teaches the exact opposite. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jihad is holy fighting in Allah's cause with full force of numbers and weaponry. By jihad, Islam is established, and Islam is propagated. Jihad is an obligatory duty in Islam on every Muslim. He who tries to escape from this duty, or does not fulfill this duty, dies as a hypocrite. From the free online book, Prophet of Doom by Craig Wynn, memorize this paragraph, shout it out to all who will listen. Every word was derived from the Quran. Every word was lived by Muhammad. It accurately represents fundamental Islam, so much so, each of the 150 Hadiths that follow this definition of jihad speak of fighting. None suggest a spiritual struggle. Among them, Muhammad says that the most important deed is jihad, fighting in Allah's cause. Thus it is painfully obvious that Muslims that claim Islam as a religion of peace are in fact hypocrites. True followers of Muhammad that get Islam will be just as happy to cut their heads off if they didn't repent 
as any other Islamic apostates. Thus, there can be no question that the ultimate arbiters among Muhammad's followers would be the most violent and savage among them, like the Taliban, or a group even more reprobate that would rule them. Meanwhile, the Muslim Brotherhood is busily claiming the Middle East in the cause of female circumcision, ultimately to be ruled themselves by such as these. That's a couple hands and a foot in this young Taliban's hand. Or like the Saudi religious police that sent 15 girls back into a burning school to their deaths for having the audacity of trying to escape the flames by emerging from the burning building without head coverings. In other words, sorely deluded, peaceful Muslim hypocrites are not only cheering on their own demise, but the destruction of their children and their children's children, particularly the girls. Because Allah afflicted Eve, all of the women of the world menstruate and are stupid. What kind of life and love must Islamic women find in husbands that spend their lives salivating over the prospect of big-eyed virgins in Muhammad's paradise? Men that kill their own wives and daughters to preserve their honor. Fight those who believe not in Allah, even if they are the people of the book. The Jews call Usair a son of Allah, and the Christians call Christ the son of Allah. Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Muhammad wishing his alter ego Allah's curse on Yahweh's people. Is it a surprise to find that the kingdom beast of Abaddon has a duty to fight against those that have come to know the love of the one true God, Yahweh, through a personal relationship with the Messiah, Yeshua, whose very name means Yahweh saves, rescues, or delivers? Indeed, Muhammad's followers that come to Christ in Saudi Arabia are beheaded to this day as apostates. For 1400 years Islam has been spread by the sword and the threat of execution for apostasy. Meanwhile, about 300 Christians are martyred around the world every day, primarily in Islamic and communist countries, for preaching Christ crucified. Neither doctrine can stand the light of the truth of the gospel. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. Do our Muslim friends really believe that our loving God, Yahweh, would annul the gospel by revealing the exact opposite of its whole subject through a single 7th century Southwest Arabian desert-dwelling illiterate whose character Islam's own books reveal as being the exact opposite of the sinless Messiah? They then surrendered to the Prophet's judgment, but he directed them to Saad to give the verdict. Saad said, I give my judgment that their men should be killed, their women and children should be taken as captives, and their properties distributed. So it wasn't even Muhammad's alter ego, Allah, that passed his judgment on the Banu Qurayza, but rather Muhammad's sidekick, Saad, gave the verdict. The Messenger of Allah commanded that all of the Jewish boys and men who had reached puberty should be beheaded. The Prophet then divided the wealth, wives, and children of the Banu Qurayza Jews among the Muslims. The Jews were made to come down, and Allah's Messenger imprisoned them. Then the Prophet went out into the marketplace of Medina, it's still the marketplace today, and he had trenches dug in it. He sent for the Jewish men and had them beheaded in those trenches. They were brought out to him in batches. They numbered 800 to 900 boys and men. Then he sat down. Ali and Zabir began cutting off their heads in his presence. 
I entered the mosque, saw Abu sat beside him, and asked about sex. Abu Sa'd said, We went out with Allah's apostle, and we received female slaves from among the captives. We desired women, and we loved to do coitus, interrupt us. Five more hadiths repeat that theme, and Bukhari alone. Always conspicuously the exact opposite, through the gospel, we Christians are called to love everyone. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, including our enemies. Internet and YouTube Christians engage Yahweh's enemies in battle every day with the sword that he gave us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. If you think God is about imperialistic conquest and beheading innocent Jewish farm boys and their dads and grandpas while sexually violating and enslaving their little sisters, mothers, and grandmas and then stealing their property, perhaps you deserve to follow Muhammad until you are judged by the very Son of God you deny. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son." If you are a follower of Muhammad and his standalone 7th century religion, why don't you at least read the gospel to learn about the love of the one true God, Yahweh, as so beautifully expressed through his Messiah, and whose people have followed him through two covenants for 3,500 years, through all of his prophets and witnesses as revealed in his 1,600-year record? Muhammad challenged and if ye are in doubt as to what we have revealed, then produce a surah like thereunto, and call your witnesses. I'll call on the witness John, for example. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. To those that have been so conspicuously and heinously deceived by the false prophet Muhammad, haven't you known in your heart for quite some time that something is very wrong with the standalone seventh century religion of your false prophet Muhammad? Jesus can fix that hole in your heart and fill the emptiness that comes from praying in the vain repetition of the heathen while prostrating yourself before the Quraysh pagan's black stone idol in Mecca. Have you ever even read the Gospel? There is even a YouTube movie, The Gospel of John, available at the link in the Show More drop-down menu just under this video. Your eternal life hangs in the balance. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son, 
Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. To those so sorely deceived by Mohammed, why not ask Jesus to come into your heart and life today, like your former brethren, whose testimonies you can view on the Muslims for Jesus YouTube channel. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. May Jesus bless you and lead you to his truth, to the truth. All you have to do is honestly and sincerely ask him to.